Good evening and welcome to Money Matters. My name is Charlie Huntington and I am the chairperson of uh, Public Relations for Life Sciences PA. Life Sciences PA is the voice of advancement for the life science, pharmaceutical, biotech, and medical device communities throughout Pennsylvania. Tonight, we continue our special series on science leaders in our local community. Before we get started, I want to remind viewers that from time to time, financial issues relating to life sciences, healthcare, or technology matters, or companies may be discussed on this show. These discussions are not and should be not viewed as financial advice. Moreover, since this program is pre-recorded and shown at a later date, please keep in mind that this information may no longer be current. You should always check with your financial advisor before entering into any financial transaction. This evening, I'm pleased to have with me as my co-host, Kim and Hatza. Kimmon is a corporate attorney at Milcrest Law in Radnor. Uh, Kimmon and his partners specialize in life sciences, healthcare, and information technology. Welcome, Kimmon. Charlie, thank you. Happy to be here. It's nice to have you here. Um, can you bring our viewers up to speed with what's new in your world and sort of what trends you're seeing since our, our last show? Sure. I'm, I'm feeling a little bit like a broken record because uh, you, you've asked me this question in the past. And um, we've been seeing probably more healthcare information technology uh, matters, at least coming through our door, than almost anything else, more so than pharmaceutical or medical device. Um, I'm, I think, you know, and I've said this in the past, I believe, I think that is in large part because with health, with healthcare IT, um, you just, it, the, from, in, from the inception of the idea to commercialization of a product is a much more uh, condensed time frame than what you see with, with pharmaceutical and medical device where you have to go through, uh, you know, all kinds of things for the uh, FDA before you actually, you know, uh, clinical trials and things before you actually see, you know, uh, a, a commercial, commercialized product. Uh, that can go to market, and that can take six, seven, or more years, uh, many times in those other fields. And and we're talking about a much shorter time frame. So if you're looking at investors who want to know they're going to be able to get their money out and get their money out quickly, um, you know the health IT is is kind of an easy thing for them to do. Uh, so it, uh, that has been what we've been seeing most of, I would say, over the past two, three years now. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Sure. So I'd like to remind our viewers that if you have questions for a later show, here's how you do it. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, send us your questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our host and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S-T-V dot com. It's with great pleasure that I get to introduce tonight Dr. Ira Spector. <laughs> Dr. Spector is CEO as of SFA Therapeutics LLC, a development stage biopharmaceutical startup company focused on a new advancement in the treatment of chronic inflammatory diseases. His prior roles have included executive vice president for analytics and consulting for Icon PLC. He was senior vice president global development operations at Allergan. He was vice president of clinical operations at Wyeth Pfizer as well as a partner at PA Consulting Group. Dr. Spector has degrees in electrical engineering and physics from Wash U, an MBA from Drexel, and a doctorate from Rutgers, and has worked on 33 approved drugs and 12 approved medical devices. Good evening, Ira, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. <clears throat> Ira, would you tell our viewers about SFA Therapeutics, please? Yes, so SFA is a completely new way of developing drugs. These are drugs that are derived from substances found within the human body, found within the microbiome in the lower GI, 
Because of that, they've been in healthy humans for eons. So they have no genotoxicity. They're very safe. Uh, so it's a new way of discovering drugs, and it means their development is much faster than classical drug development because of the safety aspects. So what we have found are ways of treating humans with substances found within the human being as opposed to going to large chemical libraries and hoping something works. Hmm. Okay. And where does the name come from? So the name is not very clever. It's the initials of the founders, Spectre, myself, uh, Feidelson for Mark Feidelson, one of the co-inventors, and Ala Arzumanyan, the other co-inventor. Thank you. Ira, I understand that you um, brought this technology out of Temple University, and I was just wondering if you could tell our viewers how that came about. Uh, so actually, accidentally. I, I met Mark at a social function, and you know, you always have to be aware of what's going on. Um, uh, <laughs> and we were having a chat, and you know, it came to the what do you do, what do you do, and he started telling me about his research, and I got more and more interested, and then I spent about a year and a half doing due diligence, visiting their lab at Temple, and uh, finally concluded that this was such exciting technology that I needed to start a company around it. Now, when we first met, you said that your primary focus currently is on psoriasis. Yes. Um, there, there are a lot of drugs out there right now uh, that treat psoriasis. You see them almost every night on TV. What, what makes what you're doing unique? So first of all, psoriasis is a great proof of concept. If you've got a, a treatment for chronic inflammation, psoriasis is a systemic form of chronic inflammation. There are many diseases that are systemic forms of chronic inflammation, including some cancers. So if you want to see proof of concept with psoriasis, it's visual. You see a change in the skin. But the reason we think we have something really unique in the psoriasis market, and that there's still an unmet need despite there being seven or eight drugs out there, is unfortunately if you have psoriasis, you only have four possible treatments. You have topical, over-the-counter drugs, the coal tars, that basically smell bad and don't do very much. You've got um, vitamin A ointments and salves, most of which don't penetrate the lesions to really affect a long-term treatment. You've got ultraviolet light, which does work, but it's pretty inconvenient. You've got to get into a booth with goggles and glasses and things like that. And then you've got the systemic drugs the monoclonal antibodies, and I've worked on one of those, Enbrel, when I was at Wyeth. The issue with the systemic drugs, and if you watch the ads on TV, that's what they're mostly about, is these are immunosuppressants. So they so suppress the immune system that they leave patients open to uh, uh, opportunistic diseases. And when you hear those ads, you hear, have you been a in a country where you may have been exposed to you know, this disease or that disease? And I can tell you, Patients are afraid of those treatments. So there's still a fairly strong uh, portion of the market that uh, doesn't really get served well where patients uh, are afraid of those treatments. And they're very expensive treatments, so the payers aren't very happy. And the physicians, given the monitoring and the complexity of testing and things that goes on with, with those treatments, are also aren't very happy. So. If the patients aren't happy, the payers aren't happy, and the physicians aren't happy, that to us means it's, there's a real unmet need. It's a bad need. combination. There's still an unmet need. <laughs> now, I know you brought some pictures with you. Did you want to take a look yeah, at some I, of those? Yeah, I, I want to start by, by saying that what we're doing is very different. Because these come out of human beings, uh, out, of, out of our system, uh, they are very safe. So there should be no genotoxicity. And they're also very inexpensive. So. Uh, we did a very small proof of activity trial just to see if there was a signal, to see if this worked in humans. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to go to uh, slide one uh, 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 to see, um, to share with you. Um, this is a subject who had uh, psoriasis covering over 50% of their body, so pretty debilitating disease. And uh, you, what you're seeing are before and after photos, uh, uh, one month's worth of treatment, um, twice a day treatment. So pretty significant treatment effect. And, uh, and uh, now if we go to the second slide, uh, this is a subject who had uh, psoriasis in their elbow. Uh, and this is after 22 days of treatment. And what's really significant about this uh, slide 
as you can see, this really shows why ointments and creams don't penetrate effectively, why we think this is an inside-out disease. It's a chronic inflammatory disease. It's mm -hmm. not just a skin disease. And by the way, most patients with psoriasis also have other com comorbidities. They have psoriatic arthritis, they have IBS, they have Crohn's, they have other chronic inflammatory diseases. And just anecdotally, the subjects in the small trial said they felt better about those. And let's go to the third one. So the third picture shows a calf uh, of a subject who had actually two forms of psoriasis, uh, which is also pretty exciting to us. And uh, this subject, uh, the before and after, is after a month of treatment. The first thing the subject said was that they could sleep better at night because their itching went away. Mm -hmm. And then they had a fairly durable response. The subject actually responded well for about four months. And the way the trial was conducted, they washed out of all treatment for 30 days, they went on to our treatment for 30 days, and then they went off for 30 days. So mm -hmm. this was to prevent any uh, chance flare effects, crossover effects. But we had a fairly durable response with this patient, which is pretty exciting. And of course, all of this leads us to believe that we have a signal, and that's very important in drug development. Well, those, those pictures were surely really very dramatic. Um, now, you mentioned before that aside from psoriasis, there are a number of like, chronic inflammatory type diseases. Um, are, are there others that you're thinking about uh, that are perhaps a likely next uh, target for yes. you? So the original work at Temple University started uh, in liver disease, um, and it started in hepatitis B, uh, NASH, and then hepatocellular carcinoma in an animal model. In this animal model, these transgenic mice are bred to develop those diseases. They develop 100% of those diseases. The treatment was used to show uh, that mice, depending upon when they're treated, it either blocks the chronic inflammation that leads to the damage in the liver, the, 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 the fibrosis of the liver is actually the end result of chronic inflammation, uh, or it prevents the recurrence of the, the occurrence of the uh, uh, the hepatocellular carcinoma. So f we had a 50% reduction in tumors in these mice and a 50% reduction of uh, tumor size. So we will be uh, pursuing uh, liver disease as well. We've patented in that area. We've actually gone global with those patents now. But given the cost of developing and the time of developing treatment in liver disease, which is over four or five years, we felt psoriasis was a faster first way to market mm -hmm. for a small company. We're also working in preventing relapse recurrence in uh, certain forms of cancer uh, that we know based on the genetics, uh, the genes that we downregulate with these drugs that uh, are elevated when patients uh, have relapse recurrence. So we believe there's a potential to create a drug to prevent relapse recurrence in lymphoma and leukemia, which we have filed for patent on now, so that can be disclosed. We're working on an, an eye disease because we have an oral drug that crosses the eye-brain barrier and reduces inflammation. The eye disease is uveitis, which is an inflammation in the back of the eye. So um, those are just some of the things we're working on. The hottest thing in cancer right now is immunotherapy. And unfortunately, patients sometimes experience severe side effects called cytokine storm, or cytokine release syndrome. Uh, we know that we downregulate some of the channels that are uh, implicated in cytokine release storms, so we filed in that. And so we think there are probably a couple of dozen potential applications, but as a small startup, we have to be very focused about what we're doing. We're filing patents and then we're going after those subsequently. So our focus is still psoriasis for now. In the short term, we think that helps to fund the company. Mm -hmm. But we're very excited about what we found. We think it has uh, other applications. When you're looking at psoriasis, excuse me, just no, no, go ahead. When you're looking at psoriasis, is it, where's it come from? Is it genetic? Is it environmental? Is it a combination of? What? So the, the origins of chronic inflammation can be uh, viral, they can be some other disease factor, infectious disease, some other insult to the, to the body. There, there's a whole body of thinking about what causes chronic inflammatory disease, and we're not sure the, fully, the full etiology. We do know, however, what to downregulate psoriasis. So we know that 
dr the drugs that work in psoriasis either downregulate TNF alpha, IL-17, IL-23, or PDE4. We are immunomodulating IL uh, TL uh, TNF uh, alpha with our drug, so we know why we're, what we're doing is working. The reason it's different than the other drugs is those other drugs immunosuppress. We immunomodulate, so we restore normal levels in the human body, but we don't suppress to the point where we leave the patient open to opportunistic infection. So the, the physiology behind the disease has been well elucidated, well understood, and we know why the mechanism of action for our treatment works. Hmm. Well, that's a, that's a huge difference and a big change from what's what's out there right now. Immunotherapy or something like yeah. that. Yeah, because because the uh, the the monoclonal antibodies, the immunosuppressants, uh, with the exception of one or two, uh, bring with them lots of side effects because yeah. immunosuppression, in general, leaves the body open to sure. further. Other Not to mention the cost, right? Yeah. Well, so that's the other aspect. So the latest drug on the market, I won't mention any mm -hmm. names, yeah, it costs about $60,000 a year. Uh, if you talk about uh, the cost of health care in this country and how decisions are made to reimburse, yeah. to get onto a formulary, the typical uh, insurance company looks at what's the 30-year net present value cost of this treatment. So the 30-year net present value cost of that treatment is about a million dollars. We believe we will be significantly lower, lower than, than those costs with a natural product, lower in costs, much better in safety. Yes, if I if if I am uh, if I'm looking for treatment, the insurance company has no guarantee that I'm going to be one of their members subscribers next year, right? Well, that's so. that's the other thing. Um, so we're you know we obviously to to market a drug in this country, it's not just about getting FDA approval; it's also about uh, getting get the payers to, yeah. to approve reimbursement. But we yeah. believe we've got a pretty strong. Uh, argument to have something that will get reimbursement. Now you mentioned uh, earlier your patents and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your patent strategy. So we have uh, a four concentric ring strategy. The first is composition of matter. Even though these were derived from natural substances, because their effects are uh, not expected, they're unexpected, under U.S. patent law, they can be patented as composition of matter. So that's the first line of defense. The second line of defense is the method of action. So we have uh, filed around specific diseases and specific applications for, the, for these treatments, and we're continuing to build on that patent estate. The third is formulation. There's some pretty sophisticated art associated with ensuring that the drug gets where it needs to be for the duration it needs to be in order to have the, the treatment effect. And so that's included in the patents. And then the fourth is combination. We anticipate that our drug may be used in combination with some existing therapies as a way of uh, reducing the toxicity of those drugs and broadening the coverage. So we're patenting that as well. So those are the sort of four concentric rings we've built in our IP approach. And is your, is your approach completely domestic at this point? No. You've got a global reach? No, this is completely global. Um, I, I've been in the industry for a very long time yes, and you I have. understand c clearly that uh, our, our goal is not to become a fully integrated drug company. Our goal is to fill that important niche in the market of bringing potential therapies to other larger, more established companies. So. For our products to have value, they have to be globally available and globally protected. And so we're filing globally with all of our patents with the idea that we will then partner with a large pharma or biotech who will then commercialize globally. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so how, along those same lines, how, how will you fund yourselves? What's your... So the initial funding came uh, with a small grant uh, at Temple University, and then the subsequent funding was my own. So, uh, you know, we talk about putting your money where your mouth is. Right. When, mm -hmm. I, when I saw the technology, I said, I'm going to invest in this. Now, we're currently in a very active fundraising campaign. We're in due diligence with a couple of potential uh, funding partners. We've applied for uh, non-dilutive funding uh, with grants from the Department of Defense. 
Uh, we've uh, applied to the National Cancer Institute and the NIH for funding. Uh, we're also working with a couple of local entities here in Pennsylvania. Um, but that will soon be followed by a Series A, so we're, we're actively in fundraising mode because like any of these kinds of businesses, you need fuel to get the plane off the ground. And Absolutely. And money is fuel here. Mm -hmm. So just out of curiosity, and if you want to speak to it, great, um, the, the Department of Defense, what would, their, what would their dog in this fight so be? So the Department of Defense and the VA have a very large population of patients, uh, and uh, you know they're very interested in what we're doing in liver disease, so uh, that's, that's part of what if we're If you can give them a better solution, better cost. Lower, they're, lower they're cost treatment. Okay. Uh, you know, the problem in liver disease is that uh, there really is no good treatment. Um, uh, the mo massive doses of vitamins are given, and patients are then followed. Uh, we've talked with uh, local um, um, liver uh, departments, nephrology departments, hepatology departments here uh, at uh, major teaching hospitals in the Philadelphia area, and there's no real effective treatment here. So there's a huge unmet need, and the DOD is very interested in what we're doing. So looking at your funding near term and then way out, what, what do you see with that? Well, near term, we're very focused on psoriasis. Okay. Uh, we're focused on getting uh, first meeting with the FDA to discuss our preclinical development plans, uh, doing a phase 2A proof of, uh, proof of uh, concept trial, mm -hmm. uh, probably a 30 patient double blind crossover design. I'm not mm -hmm. going to get too technical, but we're going to basically run the trial that you need to prove statistically that this works. We will then be seeking a larger partner to fund the psoriasis work. Okay. Um, and we're, we're planning to use the proceeds of that to then fund the rest of the company. We're also in discussions with uh, an entity about creating a subsidiary in ophthalmology um, because there are some several possible ophthalmological diseases. And the idea of an oral drug to treat an eye disease is pretty novel because um, I spent five years in eye drug development and I can tell you the inconsistency of putting drops in your eye, you mm -hmm. know, are the doses the same? Did they miss? Did they, you know, uh, the idea of a consistent twice a day treatment for an eye disease is very appealing using a, an oral medication rather than an mm -hmm. eye drop. So That's interesting. We're, we're also looking at funding that separately. So uh, it's an interesting platform with lots of uh, uh, spin out ideas and we're trying to explore them all. But we're going to stay focused on psoriasis in the short term because we think, given the data you saw, mm -hmm. that we've got the quickest uh, route to commercialization there. We wish you great success. Thank yeah, you very absolutely. much. So, so what does success look like for SFA? So I have to tell you, I, I am in this because it's my passion. Success looks like getting treatments to patients that makes them feel better and, and alleviates their discomfort. That's success. Uh, success financially for the company, of course, is rewarding your shareholders and investors and, and being able to prove that your therapy works and raise the funds and capital needed to sustain the growth of the company. So uh, I've got sort of two sets of criteria that I think of. But the first has got to be about the patients. Are the, are the patients getting relief from diseases for which current treatments are really inadequate? Mm that's where you feel that you've got success. And if you do that well, the second part will come. Definitely. Well, there are, as you know, there are a number, we talked about this before the show, there are a number of pharmaceutical companies in the, in the area, and, and uh, there are a lot of people that have been long, like PhD, long time employees of pharmaceutical companies that sort of got downsized out of the business because the companies are outsourcing their research and development, and and a lot of these folks are extremely bright people that are thinking about being entrepreneurs and perhaps pursuing uh, a technology that they had been working on you know, in their prior lives. Uh, as an entrepreneur now, what, what, would you, what would your advice be to somebody who was thinking about doing something like so that? So my advice would be go for it. You know, the, having gone through that here in the Philadelphia region after a major acquisition, and then having gone to the West Coast, I, I see a very Dis two very distinct cultures. On the West Coast, when a company is sold or, or downsized, people write a business plan. 
on the East Coast when a company sold or downsized, people write, update their resume. <laughs> and, and, and I don't think the update your resume model works as well when there aren't jobs there to, to apply for. So there are incubators here. There are universities here. We are the mecca of medical uh, uh, teaching hospitals and, and medical spin-outs mm -hmm. in the country. And yet many of those spin-outs are going to other places. And there are incubator programs, uh, uh, phase one ventures, and other, uh, other kind of programs. And my advice would be for someone to go get trained, become part of those, learn about business, and go for it. Ira, we've got about a minute left. Um, what do you think the biggest challenge would be in the Philadelphia area for us to maintain a vibrant community? So the irony life is life science entrepreneurs. The irony is the top six pharmaceutical companies all draw their origins to University of Sciences right here in Philadelphia. Eli Lilly, John Wyeth and Brother, the Upjohns, I mean they all went there. So the, this was the formative place for pharmaceutical development in the world. And yet, when I'm in Philadelphia, I ask people for money to fund my next milestone. When I'm in New York or Boston or California, I ask people to fund the company. So the philosophy is very different, and the venture capital community is very different. And I mean no disrespect to the investors in Philadelphia. I am very dependent on them. But it is a different philosophy, and, and what would really help the Philadelphia region would be to bring in more of the broad investment firms, the, the broader uh, venture capital firms, and, and just share with them the wealth of technology and, and uh, science in the Philadelphia region. That is really exciting and forms the basis for a lot of uh, advances in medicine and match the two together. Ira, thank you. We are out of time, unfortunately. I know we could keep going. Um, we're going to have to have you back to check on your success, and we're very appreciative you stopped by tonight to speak with us. Thank Kim you very and much. Thank you for co-hosting. As, as always, you did a great job. Thank you, Charlie. I, I want to remind our viewers uh, about our next guest. Our next guest is Ralph Rock from Business Solutions Advisors, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time on the show. Good night.